Iya. Welcome to the University of Connecticut Student Union Theater. We would like to remind you that there is no smoking allowed throughout the building. Please note that in case of an emergency or fire, exits are clearly marked and are located at the front and rear of the theater on the first floor and at the rear in the balcony. To avoid disturbing other patrons, please turn off or mute your cell phone. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 23rd Katzenstein Distinguished Lecture. Uh, my name is Barry Wells. I'm the head of the Department of Physics. Uh, I'm here to act as sort of uh, mostly just to get other people on stage and do what they, to give you the real intro. A couple of things I want to say first, though. Um, it's great to see all our friends and our future friends here today. I would like to mention one of the real big news for the physics department is we have a brand new refurbished building. So it's bright, airy, modern. We've developed a whole a set of new studio labs, which is allowing us to change the way we teach introductory physics using some of the latest pedagogical uh, re research. Uh, and anyone wants to come take a look, please come look around. If you want a tour, pop into the de main department office and we'll get someone to show you around. Um, So this is the Henry Katzenstein Distinguished Lecture. And on the left, you see Henry Katzenstein. And on the right, you see a somewhat younger looking Henry Katzenstein with his wife, um, uh, Constance. I think you call her Connie? Yeah. Um, so I want to say just a word. David, Henry, David sitting in the front, Henry was the very first PhD ever granted by the Yukon Physics Department. So right there, he's dear to our heart. Um, he was also a very smart man and smart enough to go out and make quite a bit of money and give us some. So um, 
He was in the UConn physics department uh, in the mid-50s. It was a very interesting time. Some of his colleagues at that time were David Lee, who went on to win the Nobel Prize in physics um, in 1996, uh, John Reppy, who was a professor at Cornell and worked on a lot of the stuff that got that Nobel Prize for David Lee, but didn't quite make the cut. Um, Henry, after he left us, went on. One thing he did is he developed a very important he, patent for analog to digital conversion and was one of the leaders developing compact disc technology. So that was fairly important. And then he went on to show he was really smart by doing something completely different. And he founded Brook Tree Corporation, which actually involves trees, or at least plants. Um, and they provided you know, a vast number of seedlings for the California agricultural industry, which is a very big industry. So this is, you know, he was a success in multiple fields. Um, and most importantly, he remembered us. He was always a regular visitor to the department. Um, he donated funds for this lecture and several other things that we do in the department. I think the major other thing is the Katzenstein Award, which is given to the best paper by a graduating senior. The list of Katzenstein Award winners is also in your program. Um, those are people who are going to be hopefully future Katzenstein lectures. Um, Henry uh, passed in 2003. We are happy that much of his family still is involved with us. Um, David Katzenstein is in the front row, and he makes, I think, just about every one of these lectures. Um, he's quite prominent himself. Uh, he's a research uh, professor at the medical school at Stanford University. Uh, specializing in infectious diseases around the world. He is here from Zimbabwe, where he does a lot of his work. And we're glad you're here, David. Another person here, which we're about to hear from next, I'm going to call up, is our president, uh, President Katsuleus. I will just say one thing. He is also a member of our department. So thank you for being here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. And a special thanks to Barrett Wells and the physics department for inviting me to be with you. It's great to come back home to my, my academic roots in physics and join you in today in this special event for the physics department, but more than that special event for all of the University of Connecticut. Uh, Chairman Wells mentioned that this is the 23rd Katzenstein lecture, uh, and it is made possible by the donation of the department's first PhD graduate. And that's a testament to the strength of the department and its connection with its alumni, something we should all take pride in. It's particularly welcome since, as we know, the contributions of physicists are often overlooked. And I don't want to sound like Rodney Dangerfield here, but you know, just this last Halloween, I dressed as what I thought was one of the most famous historical physicists of all time, arguably, Sir Isaac Newton, and I had the powdered wig and the 17th century uh, attire from the, the drama department and an apple and a physics text. And uh, I was talking to a group of students about the costume, and I said, so do you know who I am? And one of the students said, yes, of course. You're the president of the university. <laughs> so. Don't get any respect. True story, by the way. Um, yeah. Fortunately, there's no shortage of recognition of the immense contributions of our field here today. This lecture series has become a highlight of the year, not only for our students and faculty, but for members of the public as well. So welcome to all of you who've come back from, from the public to be here today. I can think of no speaker better able to continue that tradition than this year's guest of honor, Professor Dame. Jocelyn Bell Burnell is world-renowned world for her 1967 discovery of pulsars, which she accomplished, as you know, when she was still a graduate student at the University of Cambridge. And her subsequent career has more than lived up to that promise, as we'll hear from Professor Battersby in just a moment. But among her many accolades, one in particular stands out to me as exemplifying the best traditions of public scholarship. In 2018, Professor Dame Bell Burnell was only the fourth person ever to win the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, an honor that included an award of $3 million. She donated the entire amount to the Institute of Physics to fund scholarships for women, ethnic minorities, and refugee students seeking to become physics researchers.
This is someone who has not only advanced the field of physics, but who has made sure future generations of scholars will directly benefit from her success as well. One of the greatest gifts we have of being associated with a terrific research university like University of Connecticut is the opportunity it affords us to host amazing people like Dame Brunel and to gain the insight, perspective, and inspiration of meeting and hearing in person someone who has fundamentally changed the intellectual landscape of humanity. Thank you, Dame Brunel, and we are all looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. That was a great introduction. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not Professor Jocelyn Bell Brunel. Sorry. I'm going to give a slightly longer introduction to her. My name is Kara Battersby, and I'm assistant professor in the department. Um, so before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to just say a few words of thanks to, of course, uh, David Kassenstein and the family for being here and for continuing this tradition. So thank you very much. I also want to recognize two people behind the scenes who have done a lot of work to make this event possible. So Philip Mannheim has been the fearless leader of the Katzenstein Lecture Series for many years. So a lot of, I'm standing here, but he, a lot of what has happened is really thanks to him. So thank you, Philip. And uh, Carrie Sikoski, who I think has left already because she's already setting up for the dinner that's going to happen tonight, is the one who's made all the food happen, all the organizations, all the invitations, all the logistics. So just one round of applause for Carrie, please. <laughs> so it is my honor today to introduce uh, our 23rd annual Katzenstein uh, Distinguished Lecture Series speaker, Professor Dame Jocelyn Bell Brunel. So while her work in fundamental physics, was indeed awarded a Nobel Prize. As you've heard already, it was not awarded to her. And this is the first time in the 23 years of her Kassenstein Lecture Series that uh, we are having a speaker who was not awarded the Nobel Prize. It is also the first time we are having a speaker who is a woman. And so I'll let you draw your own connections there. But I will personally say that I am, for one, extremely thrilled that our department, the university, and the Kassenstein family have all been supportive of recognizing the amazing accomplishments of this woman that we're here to honor today. And I'm just, I think we're doing better than the Nobel Prize, so good for us. Yep. So as you've heard already, uh, Professor Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell is famous for her discovery of pulsars, 1967. I have to say a little bit about pulsars because I'm an astronomer, so they're a special type of neutron star. They're the rotating dense remnant of a massive star. They have highly magnetic surfaces, and they emit a beam of electron, electromagnetic radiation along their poles. This beam of light moves into and out of your line of sight as they rotate, creating regular pulses. At the time of the discovery, Professor Bell Burnell was a graduate student at the University of Cambridge, so no pressure, Perry, but I hope you're working on something inter equally interesting. <laughs> we have graduate students doing wonderful things. Um, and uh, under her supervisor, Anthony Hewish, they were constructing the Interplanetary Scintillation Array uh, designed to study another class of objects called quasars. In the course of the daily detailed analysis, she noted a strange pulsing signal in her data. She tirelessly pursued the source of the signal, which I think we'll hear more about today, and she jokingly dubbed them Little Green Man. Well, number one, the first one. Uh, the, despite the disinterest of her supervisor, she investigated every possibility. And only through painstaking analysis, years of effort, were they able to uncover that it was indeed an astrophysical source, thought to be a spinning, rapidly spinning neutron star called a pulsar. This discovery is considered one of the most important achievements of the 20th century, and was in fact, as I said, recognized by a Nobel Prize in physics in 1974 awarded to her supervisor, Anthony Hewish, as well as to the astronomer, Martin Ryle. While many condemned the omission of Belle Burnell for this award, she rose above graciously excusing the omission since she was only a graduate student at the time of the discovery. So she was very gracious about it. She has a highly distinguished career. Some notable highlights include serving as head of the Royal Astronomical Society and the first female president of both the Institute of Physics and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She was appointed Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire for Services to Astronomy in 2007. 
This is the same title that Sir Isaac Newton has. Sir is Dame is the equivalent of Sir, so Dame Jocelyn Bell Bruno. Um, her story has been featured in a number of works, including the BBC Four's Beautiful Minds and BBC Two's Horizon. She's currently the Chancellor of University of Dundee in Scotland and a visiting professor of astrophysics at the University of Oxford. As you heard from our president, she was awarded the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics in 2018. Only four such awards have ever been awarded. One was to Stephen Hawking, one was to CERN scientists who discovered the Higgs boson, and one was to the LIGO team for the detection of gravitational waves. This award recognizes her discovery of pulsars and, of course, her lifetime of inspiring scientific leadership. In addition to her research accolades, her teaching, leadership, and work to lift up women and minorities in science is without parallel. She donated the full $3 million of this award to fund women, underrepresented ethnic minority, and refugee students to become physics researchers. For these reasons and many more, she is a source of inspiration for women in science all over the world. I'd say for three reasons. First of all, her tireless advocacy of women, underrepresented minorities, and refugee students in science. Her leadership paving the way for those of us. You know, here I am standing, a, a pregnant young woman who's an assistant professor at a research university looking forward to a long and fruitful career. And that was not an option for everyone, right? And the fact that uh, she paved the way for people like me. So thirdly, her groundbreaking and profoundly important work in physics. For any one of these three contributions to our field, I would consider her to be a role model and an inspiration to live by. But for all of them, I consider her to be a force of nature who has touched more lives than we could possibly count. So it's my honor to introduce Professor Dame Jocelyn Bell Brunel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Thank you especially to the Katzentine family and the faculty president of the University of Connecticut for making this visit possible. I've had a fantastic time here, and I'm immensely grateful to the faculty and students who have had the chance to talk with. And thank you all for being here this evening. I wanted to tell the story about the discovery of pulsars and as Professor Battersby's already shown you, it, was, it took place when I was a grad student in the University of Cambridge in England. So I'm going to talk a bit about radio astronomy because it was radio astronomy that I was doing when I discovered these things. I'm going to talk a little bit about quasars because that's what my thesis was about. I'll talk a little bit about the discovery of pulsars and say a bit about what they are. But first of all, I won't need to remind you about the electromagnetic spectrum. Our eyes work with part, just a little bit of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's the bit that our eyes respond to. If we went out the blue and violet side, we'd come to ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays. And if we go out the orange and red side, we come to infrared, millimeter waves, and radio waves. I'm going to be talking about radio astronomy. We can actually do astronomy right across this band these days. In olden days, they thought this was all, but we now know there's a lot, lot more that our eyes don't see. And as of the last couple of years, there is another whole spectrum opening up that's nowhere on this slide. It's like another page behind. It's called gravitational radiation or gravitational waves. And that's a very, very new area of astrophysics just opening up and hugely exciting to see what that sees as well. Every time you open up something, you find all sorts of things. So I'm going to be talking about radio astronomy. It started following the Second World War, so started in the, the late 40s, 1950s. People who had worked on radar during the war took the radar receiving equipment, not the transmitters, but the receiving equipment, 
and turned those dishes to the sky to see if they could see any radio waves from things up in space. And they did. They found a lot. It's turned into a very prolific subject. The telescopes have got bigger. This is one in Britain. It's one of the biggest. It's just been made a UNESCO World Heritage Site because it was one of the earliest. Um, that sounds fantastic, except if you're in charge of the finances, in which case it becomes an interesting headache. But it's now a World Heritage Site. It's at Jodrell Bank in Britain, near the city of Manchester. So radio astronomy developed following the Second World War through the people initially who had worked in radar and then became demobbed and decided to go back to university and see if they could pick up radio waves from these things. And they found lots of things. Some of the things were quite weak, but there were a number of quite striking, strong radio sources up in the sky. And they'd go to their colleagues, the optical astronomers, and say, what can you see up there? Because there's something giving a lot of radio signal. And the optical astronomers would say, well, there's a, a sort of star. It's not a star that I can immediately recognize, but it's some kind of star. And what about that one? Yeah, it's a funny kind of star as well. So these things became known as quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasar for short. And at the time I completed my bachelor's degree in physics and started doing research in radio astronomy, these were a hot topic. It was a total mystery what, there were, what they were. We had got as far as the radio astronomers finding about 20 of them, that sort of number. The optical astronomers had made a little progress. They looked at the spectrum of this optical quasi-stellar object and suddenly realized that you could explain the spectrum if the object was moving away from us at quite a considerable speed. It's what we call a Doppler shift. We know that the universe is expanding and the further out you go, the faster it is expanding. So if you measured the rate of it, recession of these objects, how fast they're moving away from us, you came up with their distance. And it was large. That immediately gives us a problem. Think of a row of street lights. The nearest street light is bright, the next most distant one a bit fainter, and they get fainter and fainter the further away they are. You expect distant things to be faint. But these things were bright and distant. So what? What the heck were they? They were a huge mystery. A little bit of personal history, because I think it makes part of the story. I started life in the north of Ireland. This is the island of Ireland, and this is the island of Scotland, England, and Wales. I started life in Northern Ireland. I had some of my secondary education in the north of England. I did my bachelor's degree in Scotland in the University of Glasgow. I knew I wanted to be a radio astronomer from before I left school. Only two places in Britain you could do it. Jodrell Bank, I showed you the picture of that a moment ago, or the University of Cambridge. I didn't seem to be getting into Jodrell Bank, so I applied to Cambridge, not really expecting to get in. You have to be awfully clever to get into Cambridge. And very much to my surprise, found myself down here in Cambridge to do a PhD, to study for a doctorate. You'll notice that the sort of brown stuff here, this is the mountainous part of the country. It tends to be poorer. Down here is the flat ground, the rich arable land. And there's a bit of a gradient in Britain. Of course, you don't have anything like that in a democracy like the United States. But. <laughs> so when I found myself down here, I really felt like some kind of country yokel. They're all very clever and quite keen to let you know it. And I'm not that clever. 
and I'm pretty certain they've made a mistake admitting me, and they're going to discover their mistake and they're going to throw me out. We now have a name for this. In Britain, at least, we call it imposter syndrome. You know it here as well? Yeah. Well, imposter syndrome wasn't recognized or named at that time in Britain. But with hindsight, I can see that's what I was suffering from. So I knew they were going to throw me out at some point. I now work in Oxford University, prestigious place. This is a big issue. Some students come from a rural area or a poor area and think, oh, they've made a mistake admitting me. And if we're not careful, they take themselves off back home within the first week. So we know to look out for it. Well, I had had a bit of a fight to get where I had got. And although I knew they were going to throw me out, I decided my best policy was to work as hard as I could so that when they threw me out, I wouldn't have a guilty conscience. I'd know I'd done my best and I just wasn't bright enough for Cambridge, as I suspected. So I was working very, very hard. It's quite a good policy, incidentally, if anybody here suffers imposter syndrome. Give it your best, and they probably won't throw you out. But <laughs> give it your best. Uh, I love this quote. I wish I'd known it when I turned up in Cambridge. Frequently in error, but never in doubt. <laughs> Apparently, it's said of cosmologists. I've been told by some people, it said by Zeldovich, and by others, Landau, and I, I don't know what the truth is. But it's a wonderful quote, and I wish I'd known it when I turned up in Cambridge. Turning up in Cambridge also produced some other surprises. I was given a set of tools. These are they. I still have them. In fact, all the radio astronomy gradu graduate students were given a set of tools except for some curious guys called theoreticians. <laughs> they didn't get tools, but the rest of us did. And these are not microelectronics tools. These are serious wire working tools, because that's what we're going to be doing. And in particular, I was going to be help, helping build a radio telescope. This is part of the construction process. My particular job was all the cables, all the connectors, all the transformers. And the photograph is taken um, showing my workspace, literally in the field. I had some low loss cable that you could not coil up and take indoors. So all through the Cambridge winter, I sat in a little hut like this or another one down there, putting plugs and sockets on the ends of this expensive cable. And at this particular point, uh, my research technician and myself are checking that all the connections are good. We're measuring the impedance of the cables using a slotted waveguide. The whole telescope covered several acres. That's a little hard to visualize. Think 57 tennis courts. It was covered with wooden posts, had uh, copper wire strung up between the posts and it took six of us two years to build it. This is the finished article, and it looks homemade, because it is homemade. Um, the most visible stuff are these thousand odd wooden posts. These are to keep the important stuff out of the wet grass, because wet grass is a very good electrical short. So you have to keep your antennae and your, your wires up out of the wet grass. The actual antennae are made of copper. You can see some nicely oxidized copper bringing the signal down from the antennae to cables, which went perhaps a quarter of a mile back to the laboratory. Uh, for those who like the technicalities, it worked at 81 and a half megahertz. There were 2,000 odd dipoles. Um, it looks physically one unit. It was electrically in two halves, so we could use it as an interferometer. Um, there was about 100 miles of wire and cable in the whole thing. Uh, and again, for the technical folk, it was an interferometric array, but we could phase the angle it looked at by putting in delay cables. 
between successive rows, a bit like blazing a diffraction grating, similar sort of idea. Uh, they used valves, vacuum tubes for the receivers. I'd used transistors in Glasgow for my final year project. So I said, why do you use vacuum tubes? Whoa, transistors, noisy. Whoa, transistors, unreliable. We use vacuum tubes. They did ultimately change, but not till after I'd left. So this telescope was specially built for a particular project. Uh, it involves picking out very compact objects. At that time, there were these amazing objects called quasars. There were only about 20 of them known. They were extremely distant. They were a very, very great puzzle. But they did seem to be compact, small angular diameter. Radio astronomers also knew about radio galaxies, which were quite broad, extended things, and not nearly as interesting. So if you have the sun over here, there's gas blowing out from the sun in every direction. And the gas is not smooth. It's got kind of clouds of increased density in it. It's inhomogeneous. And as these clouds blow over the Earth, where there is a radio telescope, if the radio astronomer here is observing something way up in the sky, the signal from that quasar or radio galaxy has to come through this solar wind, this inhomogeneous medium. And it diffracts the radio waves if the source is compact. Because if the source is compact, you see it first, maybe through one of these clouds. Then the cloud blows past, and there's a gap. And then there's another cloud, and a gap, and a cloud. And the signal you pick up down here bounces up and down in intensity as you go between clouds and gaps and clouds and gaps. Whereas if you have one of these big radio galaxies, it's extended, and the radio wave comes through several clouds and, and gaps. And so as the clouds and gaps move past, there isn't the same amount of fluctuation. So neat technique. You can pick out these compact sources by looking for the twinkling. It's analogous to what we see in the night sky. You've maybe been told that stars twinkle and planets don't. The stars twinkle because although they're physically bigger than the planets, they're much, much further away. And so they have a smaller angular diameter, whereas the planets are relatively close, and they are more extended. So the stars suffer the inhomogeneities in space, and the planets don't to the same extent. So stars twinkle, planets don't. Quasars twinkle, radio galaxies don't. So fine, you just observe the sky in radio waves and look for the twinkling objects, and there are these puzzling quasars. Not quite true, because if you're looking for these twinklings, you're using a short integration time, and that does horrible things to your signal to noise. And the way you get around that is building an enormous radio telescope, so you collect lots of signal and compensate for the loss of signal to noise by making these rapid observations. So you expect a signal that bounces up and down like that where this is about one second. The nearest analogy I have to this, and it's not perfect, and I know it's not perfect, but to aid those of you who are not physicists, it's a bit like the pattern you sometimes see on the bottom of a swimming pool. So imagine yourself taking a deep breath, lying on the bottom of the swimming pool and looking up. And this pattern of light and dark blows over a head. And you see things bright and faint and bright and faint. It's a bit like that. So my main thesis project was a quasar hunt to get more than the original 20 that were known. And I was to do it by, rapid, by repeatedly mapping the sky and picking out the twinkling sources. We did have quite a short time constant, a tenth of a second. But we did have this large area 57 tennis court telescope. Um, I was the first person to use the telescope once it was built. I used it, well, I debugged it, and then I used it for the first six months. And I found about 180 more of these quasars. 
So we got up from 20 quasars to 200, which is a good size sample. And that's actually what my thesis was about, because my advisor said it was too late to change the title. <laughs> a little sad. Um, complication number one, we had no computer. At that time, the University of Cambridge had one computer. It would occupy a room about the size half of the middle block here. And it had memory like your laptop, maybe not even that. And so very few people could use it. And my thesis advisor didn't have time on a computer. He had grad students instead. And that was the case for most grad students. So our data came out on rolls of paper. There were actually three pen tracks, but only one showing in this photograph. And this chart paper occupied my life for the six months that I used the telescope. It produced 100 feet of chart paper every day. It took me four days to do a survey of the sky, so 400 feet per sky survey. And using that telescope for six months, I ended up with three and a third miles of paper. It was a big feature of my life. I very quickly got used to recognizing the twinkling quasars that I was meant to be observing. I very quickly got used to noticing radio interference. Because if you have a huge radio telescope like that, it's very sensitive. It'll pick up pirate radio stations, um, taxi radios, anything that sparks, arc welders, sparking power lines overhead. Lots of things could produce radio interference. But I very quickly got used to identifying radio interference and identifying the quasars that my thesis was meant to be about. But just occasionally, there was something else. Um, remember that I was suffering from imposter syndrome. I'm working my very hardest and most conscientiously. And I'm being really, really careful. I'm the first person to use this radio telescope. I'm taking care to debug it. So I'm checking out everything that shows on these charts. The quasars, the interference, like I've just talked about. And just occasionally, there was something else. And for those sitting near the front, I'll, I'll talk you through this. Um, for the physicists in the audience, um, this is high-pass filtered. So you're getting a lot of receiver noise, and you're getting anything else that's rapid, like scintillation. This is a little bit of low-level interference. It's somebody driving a badly suppressed car on a country road a few miles away. This is a bit of a problem. Don't know what it is. Couldn't make sense of it. It looks different in the sense that in this one, the spikes go up and down. And here they largely go up. In this one, you can see space, paper, between the spikes. Here they're in a solid mass. Uh, for physics students in the audience, when you make that kind of commentary, you're doing Fourier analysis without a computer. You're talking about the frequencies that are present. These are lower frequencies. You can see chart between the spikes. These are higher frequencies. And you're talking about the amplitudes of the different frequencies. Here the spikes go up and down. Here they largely go up. But I wasn't sort of saying that at the time. I'm just saying this looks different. And it takes up about a quarter inch. I think the first few times I saw it on the charts, I sort of logged it with a question mark and passed on. You know, I've got plenty else to worry about at the moment. I'll sort that one later when and if I have time. Um, I, I trust there are some physics students in the audience. Have we got some physics students here? Yep, great. OK. Uh, in the back row, of course, yes. <laughs> Not all of you, I know. Um, I wonder if you've experienced this. There's bits of one of your course that you don't properly understand. And there's a test coming up. And you don't have time to get it sorted out before the test. So you learn a bit parrot fashion. So if you're asked to derive something, you can derive it. Because you've learned it. You've memorized it. You don't understand it. 
but you can answer the question. And you say to yourself, I must go back sometime and understand this properly. Take time, but the test is tomorrow and I haven't got time now. It was a bit like that for me with this. Something in my brain said, I don't properly understand this. I must take time to go back and understand it properly, but I haven't got time now because that telescope is producing paper chart at a horrendous rate, and I'm already, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks behind with the chart analysis. But something lodged at the back of my brain, like that bit of physics that I didn't understand before the test, and it bugged me. And after this had happened two or three times, I said, you've seen something like this before, haven't you? You've seen something like this before from this bit of sky, haven't you? And then it gets easy, because I'm surveying the sky in strips, what we call declination. And the charts for each declination are stored in a shoebox with the declination written on the end of the shoebox. So I go find the shoebox for declination plus 23, and I get out all the previous observations of that one, and I lay them out. And I line them up. Now, those of you who studied some astronomy will know that the stars come round not in 24 hours, but in 23 hours, 56 minutes. They get four minutes earlier each day. That's why the constellations you see in the night sky are not identical to the constellations you see in the summer sky. It's that four minutes a day shift. So I line them up with this 23-hour, 56-minute day. And yeah, there's one of the quasars I'm looking at. And there's another of the quasars I'm looking at. And this is where, yeah, I noticed that one. I logged it with a question mark. Wasn't there, wasn't there. Oh, it might have been there. It's a bit weak. I didn't notice that. I noticed that one. And here's this one. And look, they all line up. This thing, whatever it is, is keeping its place amongst the stars. It's keeping the 23-hour, 56-minute day. It was a very small feature. It really shows how sick I was. Um, this, I'm dealing with an, an anomaly at the level of 10 parts in a million. Anyway, I showed this to my thesis advisor, and he said, Oh, Jocelyn, that occupies a quarter inch. We need an enlargement. Well, with this paper chart technology, getting an enlargement is fairly easy. You run the paper faster under the pen, and it all gets spread out. Yeah. So we just switch to a higher speed pen recorder. No, we don't. It runs out of paper in 20 minutes. And guess who spends their time day and night at the observatory putting a fresh roll of paper in every 20 minutes? Next best idea, the grad student goes out to the observatory at this sort of time, switches to a higher speed recording to get the enlargement, switches back to normal about here, and then gets on with the rest of her life. And I did that for a month, and I made high-speed recordings of receiver noise because this thing had disappeared. And my thesis advisor was furious. It's a flare star. It's been and gone and done it, and you've missed it. Um, grad students, if you haven't already noticed, it's always your fault. <laughs> so I skipped one day after a month of this, went out to the observatory the routine time the next morning, and it reappeared. And I hadn't been there. I didn't dare leave. I stayed on. The appropriate time, I switched to the high-speed recording. And it... Mm, 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 mm. Pulse, pulse, pulse. Mm. Pulse, 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 pulse. Mm, mm, mm. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And when it reappears, it's still on beat. It's in phase. Although the strength of the signal has disappeared, the beat hasn't. These are one second time pips down the bottom, and you can see that it's about one and a third seconds period. Uh, that is a forgery. Question, how do you know it's a forgery? 
Well, we did nickname these things, or I, I fear, nicknamed these things LGM for Little Green Men. But you don't call the first one number one. It's only when you've got several that you go back and number the first one number one. So that's a post hoc label. <laughs> but anyway, it's one and a third second. My thesis advisor said, oh, well, that settles it. It's man-made. But he came out to the observatory next day at the right time, saw it for his, with his own eyes, and we established that the period was still about one and a third seconds. This is very fast. There's a law that says if something, if a pulse changes, and this is probably about a tenth of a second, if a pulse can change in a tenth of a second, the source is less than a tenth of a light second across, so it's small. But it kept the pulse, didn't get tired, so it's got big energy supplies, so it's big, so it's small, and it's big. Took us some time to really work that one out. It's actually small in size, but it's big in mass, which gives it the energy reserves. And the small size means it can change quite fast. But it did take us a bit of time to work that one out. Tony's first reaction was its radio interference, but it clearly kept its place amongst the stars. It clearly kept a 23-hour, 56-minute day. It's not Joe Dope driving down the road from work because he's getting off work four minutes earlier each day, 28 minutes a week, and this has been going on for some months. In fact, the only people who keep that time are astronomers. Could it have been a satellite in a funny orbit? I tried to explain that. I couldn't. Couldn't find a stable orbit. Uh, all sorts of crazy things we had to dream up to try and explain this. Uh, but one of the tests we did was to see if another radio telescope with its own receiver could pick this up. And fortunately, there was a colleague with a grad student on site who had a telescope working at the same frequency. And after some heart stopping moments, they picked it up as well. So it's not that Jocelyn's wired the radio telescope up wrong, because another radio telescope sees it. Um, the next thing was a colleague decided he'd see if he could get an estimate of distance by studying dispersion. You know that when a light ray goes through a raindrop, it splits into its constituent wavelengths. You get a rainbow of colors. That's actually because the red light travels at a different speed than the violet light. That's what, how you end up with the spectrum. There's something similar happens in radio. Um, if there's a lightning strike around the far side of the world, <coughs> produces a radio wave, a sharp radio pulse. That radio pulse travels round following the Earth's magnetic field line and comes down here at Connecticut. But although it started as <coughs> it arrives as what's called a whistler. <whistles> That's a better version of it. The high frequencies travel faster than the low frequencies. And so what started as <coughs> ends up as this dispersed signal. And my colleague managed to get an estimate of how dispersed was this signal. And guessing the number of electrons in space, he said, oh, it's, it's a few hundred light years away. Puts it way beyond the sun and the planets, but well within our own galaxy. Tony, my supervisor, was still hung up on the idea that it was maybe little green men. And he argued, well, if it's little green men, little green men will be on a planet. And their planet will orbit their star. So, to help you over the next little bit, imagine I'm a small child playing on the floor. Yeah. What have I got in my hand? A car, probably a racing car. And that small child knows about what we call Doppler shift because he knows that when the car is coming towards you, it's higher pitch, and after it's gone past it, right, 
You're a load of radio astronomers. I'm a little green man on a planet orbiting my sun. And as I come towards you, it's pip, 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 pip. The Doppler shift, like the car coming towards you, going away from you, changes the spacing of the pulses. So we sat about a task of monitoring the pulses to see if there was any sign of little green men on a planet orbiting their sun. And we found one of those Doppler shifts. But let's see how it works now. You're the little green men and you're sending out pulses, and I'm a radio astronomer. I'm on planet Earth, and I'm orbiting the sun. When I'm coming towards you, your pulses are piled up, and when I'm moving away from you, your pulses are spread out. So there's a Doppler shift because of the motion of the Earth. So even if the little green men aren't moving, because the Earth is moving, you expect to see some change in the period. And we found that. So we proved that the Earth went round the sun, <laughs> but otherwise weren't making a lot of progress. And I remember a serious discussion one evening just before Christmas. Um, how do we publish this? We have one. We're doing all the tests we can think of. We still don't know what it is. We've only got one. How do we get anybody to believe us? And I went home from that discussion rather despondent. We didn't solve it. Came in that night to do some more of the routine chart analysis. Busy analyzing another piece of chart. Uh, for any radio astronomers in the audience, um, it was the time when Cassiopeia A, the strongest radio source in the sky, was on the northern horizon. And I could see it through the back of the telescope. And it wiped out about two foot of chart paper, and scanning through this bit, you know, not paying a lot of attention suddenly. Oh, what's that? I wonder. It's 5 to 10. The lab locks at 10. Grad students don't have keys. You can be locked in or locked out. Aha, uh -huh. quick action. Find the shoebox, throw out the charts for that bit of sky, line them up roughly. No, no, no. Might be there. Mm, mm, mm. There. Didn't notice that. And here's this one. They line up. That bit of sky is seen by the telescope at 2 o'clock in the morning. I've got to be there. Throw the charts on the desk and run out as the janitor closes the doors behind me. Go out to the observatory at 2 o'clock in the morning. Perishing cold, something not working properly. Get it to work for five minutes. It's the right five minutes, and it's the right setting, and in comes pulse, 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 pulse. This time, 1.2 seconds, and from a totally different bit of sky. It's not little green men. There aren't two lots of little green men who are daft enough to try signaling to planet Earth at 81.5 megahertz using amplitude modulation. It has to be some new kind of star. I went home for Christmas. Tony kept the survey running. Well, he put ink in the ink wells and paper in the chart recorder. Piled the charts on my desk for analysis. Came back after Christmas. Tony was in a meeting, couldn't find him. Sat down to do some chart analysis. Oh yes, which one's that? It's not either. It's not either. Gee. OK, I've only got another six foot of chart paper to do. I'll finish this, and then I'll come back. So pass on, pass on. What? Two of them? A meter apart? On the one piece of... Gee. At that moment, Tony comes out of his meeting. He's standing at the end of the desk. Tony, Tony, look at this, look at this. Oh, Happy New Year, Tony. Thank you for running the survey. Look at this. Huh. How many more have you missed? Go back through all your old records. <laughs> I, did, I didn't find any more. We confirmed those other two, and now we had four. So we published the first one saying, and we got some more. And then the paper for the second, third, and fourth came soon after.
There was considerable press interest. Um, one reporter said, did you ever consider it might be little green men? And being naively honest, we said yes. <laughs> and it didn't stop. But what was particularly interesting, the interviews took a fairly standard format. There'd be Tony and I, and they'd ask Tony about the astrophysical significance, which he told them. And then they turned to me for the human interest. What were my vital statistics? Would I describe my hair as brunette or blonde? No other colors were allowed. How many boyfriends did I have? Really horrible questions like that. And the photographers were saying, could I undo some buttons, please, for the photograph? It was horrible, the way young women were treated then. Um, however, the science correspondent of the Daily Telegraph was intelligent, and he said, what are you going to call these things? We'd had a discussion about whether they were pulsating radio sources or pulsed radio sources. Pulsed might imply an agency, a little green man. So we opted for pulsating. So we said, pulsating radio sources. And he said, no, too long. What about Pulsar? And Pulsars they became. And the name has now been taken over for quite a few other things. Watches, Nissan cars. I believe in the USA, the watch company tried suing the radio astronomers for use of the name. <laughs> so what do we now understand about these things? They are tiny. They're about 10 miles across. They're spinning rapidly. They've got a very strong magnetic field and a kind of lighthouse beam of radio waves comes out from their magnetic poles. And when the beam, if the beam shines in your eyes, you see a pulse, pulse. But there'll be a lot of pulsars whose beam doesn't shine in our eyes, so we don't know of them, not from this location in the universe. The right-hand slide just gives you a little bit more detail. The main thing is a strong magnetic field offset from the spin axis. They're very small, they're very dense, they're rich in the particles called neutrons. They've got phenomenally strong gravitational fields. They've also got phenomenally strong electric and magnetic fields. And they're probably formed in the explosion that ends the life of a massive star what we call a supernova. And they're primarily observed as pulsating radio stars. And it might sound like this. You hear the beat of the pulse. Um, some of them are seen in, in X-rays, some of them are seen in gamma rays. We know of about 3,000, pushing 3,000 at the moment. Uh, and a few of them are in binaries. They're twinned with another star. And indeed, in one case, they're twinned with another pulsar. And there's even a triple system. And these binaries and the triple are very good for checking out some aspects of Einstein's theories of relativity. There might be 100,000 of them in the galaxy. It's, there's some debate. They're formed, we believe, when a massive star ends its life with a giant explosion. They're the core of the star explode, that explodes, and in the explosion they get So this is a photograph of a nearby small galaxy, zillions of stars, lots of pinky red hydrogen gas, one star picked out with an arrow, and just to be absolutely clear, the arrow's added after the photograph's taken. <laughs> That's the star that we had to pick out. It's a big star ending its life with a catastrophic explosion. And it's that kind of thing that likely gives a pulsar at its core. Uh, one of the most famous ones is in this nebula. It's a star that exploded in 1054 AD and was observed by the Chinese. And in the pulsar now, there is, in the, in the center now, there is a pulsar going 30 times a second. So, They've got a mass a bit like the mass of the sun, that kind of thing, maybe just a little bit more, but it's all jammed into a ball 10 miles across. And so their density is huge. They're known as neutron stars because they're rich in particles called neutrons. 
To explain the density, take a thimble, a sewing thimble, preferably a nice silver one. Take the population of the globe, billions of people, jam them one by one into the thimble. And when you've got the whole population of the globe jammed into that thimble, it weighs the same as if it was filled of stuff from one of these stars. So they got very strong gravity, quite strong tidal effects. And for the physicists, there is some very condensed matter physics inside. Um, the strong gravity bends light. So if I'm standing on one of these stars, I can see 20 or 30 degrees over the horizon without moving. I can probably see about two thirds, three quarters of the star's surface. That must feel very peculiar. Um, the gravity also affects light. So if there were little green men on one of these stars, to us they'd look like little red men. And they also make clocks go slow. A clock there with the slow gravity ticks much slower. Actually, your sat-nav knows about this because it comes from a sat, a satellite, up above the Earth's atmosphere where the gravity is lower. Clocks down here in the stronger gravity will go slower than the clock up there. And if your sat-nav didn't correct for that effect, you'd be given a position that was several kilometers, several miles wrong. So your sat-nav knows about general relativity. Um, not only is the gravitational force pulling you down very strong, but there's a very strong gradient. So if I'm coming in to land feet first, because that's the, the ladylike way to land, there's much, much stronger force on my feet than on my head. And first of all, my body gets stretched long and thin, and then it starts getting pulled apart. So my feet fall in first, and then my shins and my knees and so on. Plop, plop, plop not recommended that you visit one of these, there is a, a health warning. They've also got immensely strong magnetic fields. To put that in context, your fridge magnet is about one hundredth of a Tesla, and these are a hundred million. And if you spin a magnetic field of that size, you get a huge voltage drop, about 10 billion volts per centimeter. So don't take your credit cards when you go to visit one of these either. But because they weigh a lot, once they're spinning, they keep spinning. And it's the devil's own job to make them change their spin. And so they become really good clocks. And nature has now provided us with wonderfully accurate clocks dotted throughout the galaxy. And we're starting to use them to check out Einstein's theories. And I have to say, Einstein's theories are checking out very, very well. There's a big new telescope in China. In its first six or eight months of operation, it's found 100 more pulsars. There's another big one in China, in, in Canada, called CHIME, um, that's also going to be great for this. It's not quite so advanced as the Chinese one yet. But I want to end with just a few crazy records. The pressure at the center of one of these stars is large. That's the number of times it's the atmospheric pressure here on Earth. The fastest known pulsar currently is this one. This is its telephone number. This is its period and it's in milliseconds and it's measured to quite a few decimal places. It's not, accurately, not actually the most accurate one. Um, the one that has the, where have I got it? Yes, there's some of them measured to 18 decimal places. I think this is just eight. So you can imagine this number going on for another 10 decimal places. Um, that one's going at 716 times a second. The next fast is going 700 times a second. And the kind of noise you'd get out from one of these you don't hear the individual, sorry. Um. Stop. <laughs> you 
don't hear the individual pulses. It just sounds a bit like your kitchen blender. The recent Nobel Prize got it wrong. The first planets beyond the sun discovered were three planets round a pulsar. And this is meant to be, this is the pulsar, this is its beams. And one, two, three, and actually there's a tiny fourth one somewhere as well. They found that because if this is the pulsar and there's a planet going round it, you see the planet's moving slightly. And even if you don't see the pulsar, you can see the movement of the planet. Sorry. Even if you don't see the pulsar, the star's moving. The roundest known thing in the universe currently stands at the orbit of this particular pulsar. It's round to five microns, and the orbit is almost is, is over half a million kilometers. For those who are into conics, that's the eccentricity. It's pretty round. And if something falls onto the surface of one of these stars from anything more than about six foot, it hits the deck traveling at half the speed of light. That's how strong the gravity is. Thank you for your interest in these amazing objects. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce you to them. Thank you. have some questions here right up here have you been to green bank have i been to green bank yes i have been to green bank okay. not on this trip some years ago uh, they held a symposium there to mark an anniversary of carl jansky's birth or death i can't remember which he died quite young a lot of the family came there were 34 janskys attending that conference <laughs> Cats and steins don't turn out like that, do they? <laughs> right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Oh, go right over here first. Sorry. And then, yeah. Actually, the best example is optical, because one pulsar, the one in the Crab Nebula, you can see is optical pulsations. And there's this amazing story way back in 1957, McDonald Observatory in Texas, um, I think an 82-inch telescope, but I may not be remembering that right. Um, McDonald specified that when he donated money to the observatory that it was to be open to the public one night per month. It's the open night. The telescope is set on the Crab Nebula, and in particular on that funny star in the middle of the Crab Nebula that we now know is a pulsar flashing 30 times a second. Mm. It's one of the few pulsars that give light flashes. Not many do, but it can also be seen flashing with light. And people step up to the telescope and say, cool, awesome, whatever they said in 1957. <laughs> and a young woman steps up to the telescope and said, that star's flashing. And the night assistants start to explain about scintillation. And she stops him and she says, no, I hold an airplane pilot's license. This is 1957 and a young woman holds an airplane pilot's license. My job is to fly newly built aircraft from the manufacturer to the customer. I fly at night. There's not much to do in the cockpit at night. I look at the stars. I know about scintillation. That star's flashing. Mm. Now, Canada used to have its mains power supply at 30 hertz. And some people could see the lights flashing, the television flashing. And ultimately, they changed to 60. So there are some people around who can see that frequency. It tends to be young women. The sharpshooters have done some research on this, and it's the young women that tend to have the best acuity. Uh, the story has been told by 
Elliot Moore, who at that point had just graduated from Chicago, was spending the summer as an intern. He became a lecturer himself and told this story to generations of students. And his message was, always follow up anomalies. Mm -hmm. Because we think she probably really saw it, that she knew what she was talking about, but nobody followed up. There are other examples, but that's the most dramatic. So always follow up anomalies. It's a good message for research. Yeah, round, go ahead. Um, it's quite often polarized. Yeah, the radio radiation. Uh, I don't know that at other frequencies they've addressed or can address that question, but quite often in um, radio astronomy, it is polarized, and in the best examples, you've seen the plane of polarization change through the pulse, which is what makes us think something's happening near the magnetic pole, where the field lines all flare out. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know that that's... Yeah, with a black hole, yes. Yeah. Uh, we now know of a number of binary pulsars, and there is fantastic physics in them. I don't know that they've actually seen that effect, but we do get lots of other interacting effects. And in a few instances, both stars are pulsars, so the effects are even more dramatic and exciting. Yeah, two very good questions. Um, we study pulsars at lots of radio wavelengths, frequencies, and some of them are also optical, X-ray, and gamma-ray emitters. They tend to be the more energetic category. Most of the research has been done in the radio wavelengths, to be honest. So yeah, we're asking questions about strength of signal, spectrum, polarization, and so on. Um, they are hard objects to understand, and we still not really... Well, one or two people believe they understand how these produce a beam of radio waves. The rest of us sort of watch them with jaw dropped because the electromagnetic, relativistic electromagnetism is fierce. Yep. So your second question? Oh, where is the source from? Right. Um, yeah, that's another very interesting question. Um, these things could have a superconducting layer inside them, and superconducting material excludes magnetic fields, so that's complication number one. Um, the naive picture is maybe the original star had some magnetic field, and as the star shrunk, that gets compressed, enlarged, made stronger. But to be really honest, I think it's another don't know yet. Um, it could be harmful if there were, for instance, a planet around the pulsar with life on it. If that planet got in the gamma ray beam, um, the life would be fried. Indeed, the planet might be fried to oblivion. Yeah, so gamma ray emission is, is quite serious. You don't want to mess with it. Yeah, it was the first four. No, because I left the field. And I had to stop observing at a certain point to write my thesis as well. Um, I think that radio telescope only found one or two more in total. It 
wasn't actually optimum for discovering pulse source. Oh, I think to be more assertive, to be fiercer, and to tell those flipping journalists to buzz off. <laughs> yes, over there. We're desperately looking for a pulsar orbiting a black hole. We haven't found one yet. The most exciting things we find are pulsars orbiting pulsars at quite close, quite high speeds. But yeah, getting one orbiting a black hole, we could do a lot more relativistic physics with that. It would be really, really important. But alas, so far, nature hasn't obliged. It probably, there's no reason why there shouldn't be, but we just haven't. And of course, we only see a fraction of them, the ones whose beams shine on the Earth. If the beam goes round like that, we never see it from here. We had a question over here. Um, what motivated me was sheer bloody determination. Um, I got married. In fact, I got engaged to be married between discovering pulsars two and three. And I got married between submitting my thesis and having the viva. And at that time in Britain, married women were discouraged from working. Um, it wasn't, it was considered shameful if a married woman had to work. It meant that he couldn't earn enough to keep both of them. And when children came along, there was enormous pressure on women not to work because it was, quote, proven that if a mother worked, the child would be delinquent. How many of your mothers worked? Great. How many of you are delinquent? <laughs> oh, this must be a physics audience. <laughs> Absolute rubbish. Um, but it, put, it made it very difficult for me to have a career. So I had a collection of jobs in astronomy. Huge fun, great variety, but it definitely wasn't a career. Until the marriage broke up 20 years later, and then I was free to pick up a career, <laughs> belatedly. Uh, over here. Sorry, I'm not, not hearing you. Can you stand up, maybe? And Anunciate, thank you. Ah, that's a good question, um, which is not I've actually ever thought of, but the beam is a few degrees across. You, you'd, you'd need good spaceships, I reckon, yeah. But actually, if you lived on another planet, you might see different pulsars. Yes, over here, in the back, yep, you, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it did, I can tell you that, but how it got the electromagnetic fields, the, the received wisdom is that the original star maybe had a bit, and when you compress the star, particularly the magnetic field gets concentrated and therefore stronger. But it's all a bit hand-waving-ish, um, really because we haven't had absolute evidence that one of these exploding stars, you know, that star exploded yesterday, and 10 years from now we'll see a pulsar there. We haven't had that example. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're winging it a bit, more than a bit. I had a question quickly. Sorry, I'll come to you next. Uh, is there any information in the shape of the pulses? Or is that just the scintillation? So like the shapes of the pulses you showed, they weren't all the same mm. shape. Is that just scintillation or is there any other information encoded? 
Um, there's probably not other information. They, pulses do vary in strength yeah. for some reason. Um, but if they have polarization, it normally behaves fairly consistently pulse to pulse. Sometimes there's weak interpulses, sometimes present, sometimes absent. Um, we're learning quite a lot about uh, the effects of the medium. The this, this space between us and the pulsar is not absolutely empty. There's a certain amount of plasma. And actually that explains some of the reason why the pulsars sometimes look weak and sometimes look strong. So there's quite a lot of different variables that we still haven't really yeah. separated, sussed out. Yeah. Had some other hands. Is there other questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Mm. Yeah. Probably the way it would happen is we find a pulsar. We find the pulse periods changing because it's got a Doppler shift, because it's moving as it goes round a back hole. And we study the orbit by studying the changes in period and begin to realize that the thing it's orbiting is very heavy. Um, that's kind of what we're looking for. But I'm sure there will be some, but we just haven't hit on them yet. Yes. The pulsars don't. They don't what? They don't fall apart. Is that what you're asking? Right. Yeah. Um, they are very, very gradually slowing. So after some millions of years, they get so slow that there doesn't somehow seem to be the boost to produce a radio beam. So they become quiet, dead pulsars. They're, it, sorry? No, you can see them, see that they get slower and slower and there becomes a limit of slowness. We don't find any slower than that, so we deduce they've died. There is one particular exception to that that's really quite dramatic. If you have a pulsar twinned with another star, um, it's pulsing away, it's orbiting this other star, it gradually slows, it stops pulsing. When it stops pulsing, it's still got its gravity. It can pull material onto it from its companion star. So I'm the dead pulsar, you're the companion star, and we're actually dancing around each other. And because we're dancing around each other, the material that I grab from you doesn't land on me dead center. It lands off center, and it actually speeds me up again, and I can become a reborn pulsar. Mm -hmm. And we see a number of those, actually quite fast ones. Mm -hmm. But mostly they just die off. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing that they're reborn. Um, it's kind of theory and dead reckoning. You see that there are some pulsars that are very fast. They're always twinned with another star. And you formulate this idea. And then you watch some other pulsars twin with a star as they die. And you see that the dying is a bit intermittent. And you begin to wonder what's going on. And in the intervening period, um, while they're sitting there grabbing material off their companion, they're probably emitting x-rays. So we have seen some x-ray sources become radio pulsars again. So it's by patching together bits of evidence from here and there. Back, back there? Yep. Right. Um, haven't seen it happen, but what should happen is they probably become a black hole. Um, yeah, it's quite feasible. You know, the orbits may shrink, they may spiral in, they may merge. There's been at least one and maybe two examples of this from the new gravitational wave detector called LIGO. Because, let's see. 
You know there's gravity between everything? So there's gravity between this bottle and between me. And even though we may be orbiting each other, the gravity gradually wins and we end up merging. So similarly, two neutron stars, two dead pulsars, can spiral in and ultimately merge. And I think it's now that there have been two detections of that from LIGO, certainly one. So we we're beginning to get real evidence of that happening. And it forms a black hole. Right. Um, there have been thoughts given to the idea of quark stars, stars made of really bizarre particles called quarks. And a little bit has been worked out about them. They would tend to be physically slightly bigger than a neutron star. Um, I think they spin faster, if I remember rightly. Um, so people have some idea what they would look like. And in a sense, they're looking for them. But so far, everything peculiar we've seen can be explained as some sort of pulsar. So no direct evidence yet for quark stars. But they may come. Yeah. All right, one final question. Yep. Right. Um, antimatter with gravity would pull in ordinary matter from the neighborhood. And when you mix matter and antimatter, there's usually a, a flash of gamma rays. So you'd gradually get your antimatter star shrinking in mass, because some of its antimatter would combine with matter and gone into a gamma ray. So you'd see little sparkles of gamma rays and a pulsar or antimatter star that was reducing mass. I'm not quite sure how you would identify the star itself, but when we get really good at gamma rays, really, really good at gamma rays, maybe that would be a possibility. Nice question, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.